Jack Tinker presents a personal view of a town which has been his home for 20 years, in all change for Brighton. It didn't matter how dreadful the play had been, or how bilious my review of it for the next morning's editions. This ride home used to be a real pleasure. Not anymore. These days it's a very different journey. The glamour has gone, so has the restaurant, and so has the non-stop schedule, and the train is usually late at the end of it. But until seven years ago, this would have been the 11 o'clock Brighton Bell, which usually ran on time. For those who never knew it, the bell was our equivalent of the Orient Express, an Art Deco rolling restaurant that gobbled up the miles between London and Brighton in 55 minutes non-stop. From Monday to Saturday, it was crowded with theatre folk and theatre goers returning from the West End. The conversation and the personalities were always so exhilarating that I used to call it the Algonquin Express. Well, like so much of Brighton's former glory, all that has now gone in the name of improvement. Yet it was the railway that first opened up this town. It turned it not only into London by the sea, but into a miniature Hollywood. And now, ironically, it's the railway that's driving away the theatre colony in droves. And the council, what's more, seem determined to aid and abet it, because they discourage not only long-suffering commuters, but the residents and visitors too. There weren't any tower blocks here. When no. I first came at all, it has changed incredibly, I must say. You don't notice it day to day, but maybe you haven't been down a certain street for a few months and suddenly it's... What happened to that lovely old... Oh, it's gone. Mm. Yeah. It's all car parks, you know. That's uh, the feeling one has. It, Brighton could end up just being one huge car park, one big conference centre and one marina. Yeah, and also the difficulty of getting here now. I mean, to and from, I mean, you, you couldn't be busy. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got the grey whistle test, you've got your radio, you've got the columns in the, in the paper. I mean, is, is it, does that physically make it difficult to live here as well the, the traveling yeah uh yes obviously it does we all kid ourselves that we live an hour from london mm. so we say oh no 55 minutes and marvelous and boast about it to people who live in orpington and all this the thing is that it, it really isn't an hour because by the time you've actually got to the station from where you live and you've waited for the train or it's been cancelled and you wait it for the next one and then you get to your destination f f the other end it's often more like two hours and what about the buildings i mean you've been campaigning to save some of them haven't you yes well the, the station building which is one of the few examples of that particular kind of architecture i mean i did my little bit and it wasn't a lot and i actually don't know what the current situation is whether it's all going to be knocked down or not and obviously like everybody else we all want to save the west pier and i still can't believe that it can be allowed to fall into this sort of hideous decay when all this millions of pounds is being spent on a very tatty conference center and i have to say inside already it's looking tatty if brian has got his history of elegance where is it now i have nothing against you know modern New architecture building. right it's the american express building i think it's quite attractive blue and white and it looks it looks sort of brightish it's carried on the colors now that's a commercial enterprise they seem mm. to care more about uh, about our culture, if you like, than, than the people who are actually in charge of it all. So there's no reason to do that it should look so hideous. I mean, the top-ranked building is, of course, the ugliest building in Britain. It must be quite extraordinary degree, how yeah. that ever was given planning permission. The thing is, all we do is moan and we don't do anything about it. No, but we just look like everybody else at the, at the end of it. I mean, with, you start yeah. with a unique town mm. and you finish up with something that looks just like everywhere else. Yeah. What I get out of it now, mostly, is the... Uh, oh, it sounds really sort of ridiculous, but walking along the beach in the winter, that still knocks me out, you know, and there's nobody around, and that is yes, wonderful. Yes, you've got the town to yourself. Yes, then you feel it's yours again, you know. Even Lord Olivier of Brighton doesn't live in Brighton anymore. He and his wife, Joan Plowright, used to reign unobtrusively over the theatre colony from these two connecting houses in this graceful Regency terrace. I remember the day that 
we learned that he'd become the first actor ever to be elevated to the House of Lords. And he'd taken the title the Baron Olivier of Brighton. Robin Maugham, the author, was giving a small supper party just around the corner there for Hermione Badley. And the Olivier's popped in just towards the end of it. And I must say, the sun was coming up over Eastbourne by the time that we'd finished celebrating that extraordinary honour. Well, now sadly, Olivier's gone. A refugee not only from the defective train service, but from the desecration that the planners have wrought on a town that is a fascinatingly schizophrenic playground. All Queen Anne front and Mary Anne back, as my Lancashire grandmother called it. Elegance on one side, vulgarity on the other. This was the speculative development of the Prince Regent's Day. Just compare it to the results of modern planning and its expertise. Yet how could the old Brighton have been anything else but excitingly different? Before the last century, it was just a tiny fishing community. But it was here that a pleasure-loving prince created his fairy tale palace, housing in and around it the most cosmopolitan court in Europe. Victoria hated the classless vulgarity of the town, even more than the exotic taste of her wicked uncle's seaside folly. She sold the royal pavilion, lock, stock and barrel, to the town council of the day, but not before she had thriftily removed most of its treasures. I sometimes think that if the building were offered to the present local authority, they'd clear the site immediately for yet another national car park. In the 40s, there actually was a scheme to knock it down and build flats. In the 20 years that I've been in this town, there's been only one recognizable planning policy throughout, and that is that if every street can't have its own car park, it should be a car park. This town has become a car park collector's paradise. Some of these streets have been demolished for 30 years and are still just empty wastelands waiting for what? More parked combustion engines? So far as I've been able to discern any forward planning, it's been to destroy almost everything that gave Brighton its special salty blend of sophistication and raffish fun. Fanny Burney, the novelist and diarist, used to entertain the literary luminaries of the day, Dr. Johnson among them, in a lovely black cobble-fronted house which stood on this spot. But that house, with all its memories, and whole streets of houses like it, were flattened to make way for this modern shopping precinct. On a brisk, breezy Brighton day, you can be blown clean off your feet down its wind tunnels and still never know you're by the sea. It could as well be East Croydon or Neasden. And behind West Street, in what used to be the Hippodrome, the largest theatre in the town, audiences today raise their voices only to shout, bingo. But I can still hear the echoes of Sophie Tucker, Max Miller, Sammy Davis Jr., and all the top liners that I once reviewed here. Red hot mama, red hot mama, you're the one we need. They all stood up, 900 of them, with little short shirts on, no longer than that. Some of the men were taller. Here, they, they... <laughs> And just to the north of the clock tower, until five years ago, stood the Regent Cinema and Ballroom, another splendid Art Deco extravaganza. It used to be said that at least a third of Brighton's marriages could be traced back to the Regent. Really marvellous place, you know, there's uh, never been another place like it and, um, you know, 
there used to be 2,000 people or more on a Saturday night. You used to have a bit of gang warfare where you had uh, the mods at one end, the rockers at the other end, and uh, they used to have a little gap at the back of the bandstand where all the clashes used to be. It was a sort of a blind spot for any of the um, uh, bouncers and things still on there. You know, so you could, you could never replace a building like that. Yeah. The floor itself was actually a feature, wasn't the it? The floor itself? was uh, the only one of its kind that I know of. It, uh, when everybody was on the dance floor, uh, it used to spring up and down about 18 inches in either direction, you know, when they were doing the conga and uh, things like that, you know, because you, you got this um, amazing bounce on it. And, uh, you know, I remember it very well because uh, I used to work for a firm that uh, had to do the maintenance on the uh, region dance floor and we used to have to go in every Monday and Tuesday after special dances and things like that and do structural repairs to the springs underneath the floor. It was a building that would never be replaced again. And it was true about all those marriages, wasn't oh, it? Oh, definitely, yes. Yes, I used to take my wife there all two or three times a week, you know, and we really used to enjoy ourselves. I wonder if Boots the Chemists, now being built on that corner, will ever repeat that romantic claim. The SS Brighton, a vast ice rink and sports arena, went the same way. It used to stand at the point where the station spills its trippers onto the promenade, a prime site. The council encouraged the rank organization to build this in its place, build it moreover, with nothing but concrete facing out over the channel. Actually, public outrage prevailed, at least up to a point. One rather self-conscious window eventually was allowed to interrupt the architect's streamlined concept. Up here at Black Rock, there'll be no high divers this season and no bikini-clad girls to applaud them either. The pool has been allowed to decay so disastrously that the only solution, so the planners tell us, is to scrap it entirely. And wouldn't another car park here be a useful amenity for the controversial multi-million pound marina they allowed to be built on this stretch of public beach? At the moment, they've got a boat show on. But whether or not the marina eventually justifies the loss of that beach, it has at least brought Brighton a direct link with the continent through its new high-speed space-age jet foil. A welcome rebirth of the popular paddle steamer service which once shuttled people back and forth to Dieppe. But here is the living, or rather dying, proof of what's happening to the spirit of Brighton. The piers and the gaudy subterranean arches which run between them were immortalised in modern folklore by Graham Greene's Brighton Rock. Now, the West Pier rots before our eyes, among the oldest of those handsome follies which allowed Britannia's landlubbers to walk above the waves they ruled without getting their feet wet. But now, as it prepares to sink slowly out of sight, a do-it-yourself sort of help is at hand. John Lloyd began waging a one-man, do-or-die fight to save it. 
Now he's riding a bandwagon which resists all attempts to stop it. He says the pier's not as bad as it looks. No, no, it isn't. It looks very rusty, yes. Yeah. But this pier can be repaired. There's no doubt about that. Our engineers assure us of that. So what's the state of play now? Well, as you may know, we've had this offer from the council of £300,000. And not giving us this money now, but they say they'll give us the 300000 when we've collected the rest of the money required to open the pier for public use and enjoyment. And how much is that? Uh, so it's a lot of money, but we've got a lot of support. Um, I would say, at a rough, very rough guess, mind you, somewhere in the region of two and a half million, then we get their contribution. You need a lot of support for that, don't you? We you've do. had it, haven't you, though? You've got Sir John Betjeman heading the um, yes, appeal indeed. committee. Yes, And uh, our petition got 5,000 signatures in about 10 days campaigning, which is really tremendous. You know, that was incredible. People were demanding petition forms urgently. How are you going to set about raising the money? What sort of events? As you know, we are engaging professional fundraisers. We are doing it in three stages. First of all, the local appeal, which is going now. And then, later in the year, a national appeal will be launched. There's a tremendous amount of support for the pier in other parts of the country. People who spend happy weekends in Brighton and so on. Remember the West Pier with affection. And then, finally, next year, an international appeal, which will be particularly in the United States and Canada, where the support for Brighton's Victoriana is very strong. So how long do you think it'll be before Brighton gets its West Pier back again? Well, it's going to get it back, I can assure you, but it'll be quite some years because there's a lot to be gone through. But uh, we're not going to give up. I'd say 1983, it could be opened to the public. Meanwhile, along the promenade, a question mark also hangs over the lovely old auditorium at the end of the Palace Pier, since it was damaged by a winter storm but at least there's still the magnificent and unsubsidized Theatre Royal. It's here that Brighton's reputation as a theatre town now stands or falls. This is the seat that I occupied every Monday night, week in and week out, for nine years as the theatre critic for the Brighton Evening Argus. So I suppose I'm not entirely unbiased when I say that, in my opinion, this is one of the finest theatres of its kind in the land. It's perfectly proportioned and it's beautifully restored. And that's thanks mainly to the generosity of one very rich businessman, Louis Michaels, and the dedication of a small board of local directors who make this place more and more inviting to come to because each year they plough the profits back into the furniture, into the fabrics and into the fittings of what is an exquisite building. The managing director of that board is Melville Gillam, you want to know how we do it? By the sale of programmes, ice creams and bars, six of which we've got in the theatre. So I find it incredible that you've got no subsidies here, you know. And you still keep going? Yes, we and do. And you've been going since...? July 1807, when the first charter was granted by George IV to this theatre. That probably gives the Brighton audiences unique flavour. I mean, they're so used to theatres now, they know exactly what they want, don't they? Well, it's a town that's been associated with theatre from a long time. Mm. But also, it's a great tryout town, isn't it? Yes, it has been always, always. Yes. Uh, prior to London. I suppose at the moment you could, there are seven plays in London that have already been seen at Brighton now. Yes. But do you find it more or less difficult now to fill this theatre with the sort of thing that people have been used to since very, 1807? Very much more difficult. Where there were 20 production companies uh, in the past, there are now about six. So what do you do? Well, we hope that Mr. McCorber will provide and something will turn up. And it always does, actually. Yes, it does. Yes, yes fortunately. Yes. Yes. And not only do our audiences very loyal, but the stars like coming here, don't they? Yes, they do. And Brighton, I suppose, is just as famous in America as it is here. I mean, world-famous stars like Bergman, Dietrich, um, Hepburn, apart from all our famous stars of our own in England, uh, Olivia Richardson, Gilgood, Thorndike, Edith Evans, you mentioned they've all played at Brighton. It's not always easy playing host to people like that, is it? No, it isn't. No. no. You've had hairy times, I should imagine. Some amusing incidents have happened, as instance when the first time that Marlena appeared, uh, we were all very much on edge as to, to please her, and um, there was a tremendous thunder and lightning storm about a few minutes before the performance started. 
and one of our management was mopping the water which was pouring through backstage and as she passed he turned to her and said I'm terribly sorry about this and she said oh don't worry I played in worse places than this which made him rather angry and um, said I think that's most unkind of you and she turned around and picked her dress up and knelt on the floor and mopped it up and she said don't worry my dear I shall perform the curtain will go up and they became great friends the whole week and she came back and back twice more she came to mm. us Perhaps the spirit of the Theatre Royal is what keeps Brighton alive. This equally elegant and even older building, the Royal Spa in Queen's Park, was threatened with demolition a few years ago. In its heyday, the Royal Family had lined up here to take the health-giving waters. But only the intervention of the Secretary of State prevented it being demolished in 1970. It took a four-year fight by a band of angry residents to stop it being handed over to a London entrepreneur for a restaurant or a casino. They won the day. Instead, it became the setting for what must be one of the choicest nursery schools around. Less fortunate was the beautiful Regency Gothic schoolhouse, which used to close the view along the colonnaded new road so perfectly. That was pulled down to become, yes, another of those temporary car parks. The neat town cottages behind it would have gone too, replaced by buildings like this. It was named Theobald House after the long-serving chairman whose committee masterminded it. And for this, strangely enough, we should be grateful. The next stage would have been a massive flyover, presumably to bring in the traffic even faster to their mushrooming industry in car parks. But then the local people said, enough. The North Lane Community Association was born and with it a new community spirit. What had been a desolate slum clearance area has begun to take on the look of a little Chelsea. It even has its own newspaper, the North Lane Runner. Partly paid for, ironically, with a grant from the council as a registered charity. What are we going to have for the front page? Well, uh, I think a good idea would be to have that big picture that we've got from the uh, Argus um, about the King Street car park. Um, it's this one. Uh, it, it would look good on the front page, and it's a very important issue for us because, uh, I mean, 600 cars is going to mean a lot of traffic generated in our area. Perhaps you could do a, a headline, um, something simple like car park protest, um, uh, in 36 bold. 36 bold? Yeah. This is actually the petition. That's the petition there, being yeah. handed over, yes. Yes. You want the centre at the top? Yeah. Okay. Have we got the article there on the community centre, Jackie? Because I really think we ought to use it this time, you know, and sort of keep plugging away at the fact that we are trying to get a community centre for the association. Yes, I've got a piece here which um, summarises the state of the negotiations so far, so we could put that on the centre page, do you think? What do you think, yeah. so? I think it ought to go somewhere yeah, fairly prominent. Fairly prominent centre page. OK, thank you, Jackie. I think it'll be really good when we get actually get the premises. Yes. It's been a so long. long haul, but mm. we'll be able to have all of our meetings there and functions, especially for the old people, mm. teas and what have you. It's not something we've got ideas for children as well. Mm -hmm. so we need a, really need a play area. And I think we ought to use this piece about the Guardian article, which mentioned North Lane, and in particular it mentions the council neglect of our area. Do you agree with that? Mm. Yes, I think that would be a good idea. It shows the national press is uh, interested in us. Um, perhaps we should use it as a page lead. Um, can you deal with that, Alan? Yes. Sir. Two years ago, against all the pollsters' predictions, Councillor Theobald lost his seat for this ward on the County Council. And he lost it to a young man who made the preservation of the heart of Brighton his main election platform. His name was David Rogers. Now, David, that was really a David and Goliath victory, wasn't it? What was your ammunition? I think the neglect of the town centre over the years and the fact that people felt it was time for a change. Well, they got the change, but have things changed themselves? Not sufficiently, in my opinion. Uh, it's still an uphill struggle to uh, get more improvements for the town centre. Have there been improvements? There's been one. There, there's a number of very nice new houses being built in Frederick Street, but uh, we can only set that against... On the same scale as this? On the same scale as yes. these here, but we have to set that against the 37 derelict sites in the town centre. Yes, indeed. Now, local government isn't the sort of thing that most young men go into. Uh, you're a young man. Why have you given your time, your energy to it? 
Well, yes, I'm the youngest member of the County Council, in fact, um, and I, I've given up the time because I feel very much involved with what's happening in the town centre and I, I want to play a part in it. What would you like to see done? I would like to see more influence for town centre residents in planning matters and uh, pedestrianisation measures and also an end to the, uh, the huge number of car parks that we have in the town centre. Against all the odds, David Rogers was elected to Brighton's own council last May, along with two like-minded colleagues also returned by this sorely tried central district. Theobald House remains a lonely, if sadly lasting, memorial to those old council policies. Policies which are now being fought here and elsewhere in the town. Here, for example, on the other side of the old Steen, behind the busy St. James's Street shopping area, is a delightful row of pebble-fronted houses. For years, they've been threatened by various redevelopment schemes for the site immediately behind them. But for the past three years, there's been a local resident society which has been fighting off an allied supplier's proposal for a supermarket and a multi-storey car park. They've now got 360 members and have put forward their own alternative plan for small-scale residential development. Mr. Alloway, what would be the effect of this uh, development if it went ahead? Well, as you can see, the whole thing is grossly out of scale and character with the area. Um, so far as the immediate area is concerned, the size, the height of the building will tower above uh, the houses in uh, George Street. It'll be right up to the eaves in St. James's Place. It'll obscure all their rear windows and take the light from the side windows, besides allowing direct access from the top car deck straight onto the roofs of St. James's Place. And how many houses are going to be lost? Well, uh, eight have been lost, uh, 11 have been lost already. Sorry. Uh, five more from Little George Street are to go, and uh, the planners are trying, the developers are trying to uh, get, take over the two in St. James's Court as well. Of course, some of them do look a bit derelict and past well, redemption, Well, I know they, they do, but um, we know of two organisations who'd be delighted to take them over and rehabilitate them. And in any case, Allied suppliers themselves are proposing to rehabilitate numbers one to three in Little George Street. Mrs Bundy, you may lose your house under this scheme. Now, how do you feel about that? I feel very strongly about it, indeed, and I have no intention of moving. Even though they've offered to rehouse you? That wouldn't be for two or three years' time, and I shall then be 84, and it's too late in life to start making such a big change. I've been there 24 years, or we had at the start. I'm alone now. 24 years and I hope to end my days there. And you're still doing voluntary service in this area too, 24 aren't you? years of voluntary service. I've been mm. out delivering meals all the morning, four mornings a week. I've been doing until recently and now I do three, non-stop. I never, I, I'm never away except in perhaps for a week in the summer. So you're going to fight this plan all the way? Yes, I am. Ten pence apiece. Come along now. Sold it out. I even know this one. Twenty. Uh, Thirty. Oh. Hurry up. Last chance. Is that one going? Yeah. What's I do back here? I don't know. What time do you mind? I've got a watch. They took, they took the watch away from me when I was in the nick. How long have you been in here? You don't need bird or something? Yeah, three bands. You're trying to get Two, two, one. All items guaranteed. Oh. Oh. Right. And you'll get to love it. <laughs> When you come down here, early on Saturday mornings, to the Upper Gardener Street Market, with this bizarre mixture of antique treasures and jumble and junk, how can you doubt that the real spirit of Brighton is still alive and thriving? Now, I'm an optimist, and so are men like John Lloyd and David Rogers. And we believe that Brighton is not only worth living in, but fighting for. And soon, who knows, even the men who run the place will come to believe us. The supermarket plan, which the George Street Area Society had been fighting, was turned down by Brighton Council. The site owners say it's now been superseded by a proposal for development on a reduced scale. This would mean a reprieve for two cottages in St. James's Court, including Mrs. Bundy's.